All right, so like I said, our theme for the year is freedom, and I am very excited for this theme, and here is why. In freedom, there is incredible power for the people of God. Freedom is one of those things <clears throat> that if we can truly grasp it, we will do damage. We will be people of power and of strength and of love. There's a reason Satan tries so hard to hinder our freedom. It is because if we are free, we will set others free. If we are free, we are powerful for the kingdom of God. If we are free, we're not burdened or distracted by the things of the world and the politics and the drama and all this stuff. Our focus is God and his mission. And this is why God fights so hard for the freedom of his people. And this is why Satan tries so hard to hinder that freedom. And so the questions we want to ask today are, are you free? If not, why? What are you waiting for? What have you yet to receive? Because if you have freedom, if the sun sets you free, you are free indeed. The gospel will go forward from the people of God if they are free. Now here is a definition for us to begin with. Um, this is going to be overhead for you. It says this. Freedom is a state that emerges after God has acted to remove all hindrances. Social, spiritual, sin and death. Economic and institutional that block our creational purpose or the purpose for which we were created. Here is the purpose for which we were created. This purpose is to glorify, know, love, worship, and enjoy God forever. This is a freedom that has been won for us by the death and resurrection of the Messiah. By the power of the Spirit, the Christian seeks to live into his freedom and to join with God in freeing others. While we await freedom's full realization at Christ's second coming. This is the freedom that we fight for. This is the freedom that God fights for. This is the freedom we ought to understand. Freedom is to love, enjoy, worship, and glorify God forever. This is the beauty that we get to live in. Now, we have to understand what true freedom is, or we will miss it, we will abuse it, or we will never experience it. Freedom is a powerful thing, but if we don't understand it, we will never walk in it. So I want you guys to check out this picture here. This is a picture of Paul, not a picture, it's a drawing, obviously they had no cameras. This is a picture of him. Now what are around his hands and feet? Shackles, chains, right? Where is he sitting? Prison. In a prison, a jail cell somewhere, right? Now if you were to take this picture and then maybe like a picture of Caesar sitting in his palace with his, you know, his servants and whatever, and you were to take that into the world and ask, the, ask people, which of these two are free? Who do you think they would say? Caesar. Caesar's in a palace, he can have whatever he wants, he can do whatever he wants, he has all the money, all the fame, all the power, this dude's locked up, right? Obviously Caesar's the one who's free. This is why we need to understand what freedom is. Because Paul is more free sitting in that prison in chains than Caesar is in his palace. Caesar has money, he has fame, he has servants, anything that Caesar wants, he has but to say the word and it is his. Paul is chained to a wall. Caesar has all of that. Paul has Jesus. Therefore, Paul is more free than Caesar. Family, if you think freedom is in having everything you want, you have no true freedom. Having everything you want will not grant you freedom. Having Christ, that will grant you freedom. It must be Jesus. And so here is our benediction verse for the year. This will be overhead, but I want you to turn, if you haven't already, to Galatians 5, chapter 13. I'm sorry. Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. Galatians 5, 13. And here's our benediction verse. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now this is our benediction verse for the year. I pray it does not take us an entire year to memorize these two verses. Matter of fact, in a month, you should probably have this down. But we want to have this memorized and internalized. Why? Because again, if we understand what freedom is and what it isn't, we will begin to walk in what freedom is and deny what it is not. Now some context for us as we go into this book of Galatians, this is the letter in which Paul writes these words, foolish Galatians. Who has bewitched you? Now, this is strong language, especially from Paul who writes stuff like, my brothers in Christ, I long to be with you. You are my crown and my treasure. I long for you with the affection of Jesus, my very heart. Right, like he writes these things to his friends and to these guys, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? 
Now, why does he write these words to them? Paul has preached the gospel to these people already. They have received the gospel in power. They have understood the freedom in Christ. When Paul leaves, these Jews come into town and they start telling all of these Christians, if you want to be forgiven, if you want to be saved, you must follow the law. If you want to be saved, you have to get circumcision and you have to follow the rules and the rites and the traditions and all this stuff. And the Galatians go, okay. And they fall back into this bondage. Paul finds out and that's why he's writing this letter. There's a passion and there's a fire in Paul's words because they were free. And they walked back into this bondage, this righteousness by their works. And so he is frustrated. He wants them to understand true freedom. Galatians 5 verse 1 so just go to verse 1 in chapter 5 there. Paul writes these words. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Why did Christ set us free? Why did Christ set us free? Freedom. freedom. Yes. This tells me we don't really understand it. Why did Christ set us free? Yeah, freedom. Woohoo. He set us free so that we would be free. So that we would know freedom, enjoy freedom, love freedom, give freedom. We are free because Christ has made us so and he has made us so so that we can be free. Therefore, do not submit yourself again to a yoke of slavery. Now I want you to pick out a couple key words here in verse one. Paul says, do not submit yourself. Meaning, nobody else makes you go back into bondage. You must submit yourself again to slavery. Satan can tempt you, the flesh can tempt you, but you submit yourself again to slavery. That word submit, right, is to be subject, to be entangled. Don't let yourself be burdened. Don't get tied up again to a yoke of slavery. Notice he says the word again. What does that mean? That's where you were. That's where you lived. That's where you existed. You have been pulled out of slavery. Don't go back again willingly. Do not go back again. Now, why does he give the command to not go back? This seems like common sense, right? If somebody frees you, why would you run back? It's a frustrating thing, I'm sure, for Paul and for Christ when people go back to slavery. Growing up in Haula, there was a river behind our house and we used to go catch tilapia. We never ate them because that river was pilau. You know, eat that fish, okay? But we were kids, we were bored, we didn't have nothing to do, so we would just catch them and throw them back. One day we saw this golden tilapia in the river which sticks out when the river is all brown, yeah? And so we wanted to catch this one thing, so we kept throwing bread. We finally caught it, we was looking at it, oh, right on. And of course, one of our uncles and aunties is like, okay, throw it back. So we throw this fish back in the water, takes a U-turn and jumps right back on the shore. And as kids, we cracking up, right? Hilarious. The second time we pick it up, we throw it in, same thing. We throw it in again, it jumps back onto the bank, and by now, Uncle or Auntie is yelling at us like, bro, put the fish back in the water. We try. We're trying to set this thing free, and it keeps jumping back to where it's in trouble. Do you pick up what I'm putting down? We wanted it to be free, and it kept jumping back to where it was in danger. Paul is saying to these Galatians, why are you subjecting yourselves to slavery? You are already free. Enjoy this freedom. This is the desire that Paul has, that they be free. This is the desire that Jesus has for you, that you be free. Do not subject yourself again to slavery. Now, if you want to understand how valuable something is, you want to see how much it costs. You want to look at the price, what was paid for it, right? And we've heard many times in this country, freedom is not free. It was paid for. Well, the freedom that we have in Christ was also paid for. And what was the cost of that freedom? Jesus Christ, his life, his death, his resurrection, your freedom cost Jesus Christ himself. That is how valuable your freedom is. Christ paid for it with his life, his death, his resurrection, his holiness, his majesty, his deity, his perfection. This was how much your freedom cost. Why would you lay it down so cheaply? Paul is asking the Galatians. This perfect price was paid, and it was paid for you, hear me when I say this, this price was paid for you gladly. Jesus gladly paid the cost for your freedom. John 10, 17 says this, this will be overhead for you. Jesus says, for this reason, the Father loves me, because I laid down my life 
that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down. And I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. Now this is not just a commentary on Jesus' power that he can lay down his life and he can take it up again. This is a statement of how freely Christ paid this cost. Notice he says, no one takes my life from me. Now that's an interesting statement when you read the story of Jesus because you would ask, well didn't Judas do that? Didn't he sell you out for 30 pieces of silver? What about, what about the battalion of soldiers that he brought to take you away? Didn't they take your life? What about Annas, this high priest who had this mock trial? Didn't he take your life? What about Pilate, this man who washed his hands and said, do with him what you will? What about the Jews who marched you up there? What about the, the centurions who nailed you to the cross? Didn't they take your life? The answer, family, is no. No one could take his life, and that means he had to choose every step of the way to be obedient to the Father. John Piper says it this way. At every point where it looks like he was under constraint, every moment where it looks like he was being forced to do what he did not want to do, Jesus was not being forced. He was choosing it. He was embracing it. Indeed, he and the Father were orchestrating it. Notice, because they love you. No one takes his life from him. He lays it down on his own initiative. Jesus' love is free. The cost that was paid for your freedom was given freely and it was given gladly. Jesus does not pay for your sin begrudgingly. He's not walking to Calvary going, hey, they better be grateful for this one. I hope they realize how much I've done for them. He looks at us as sinners, lost and sick, and has compassion for us and gladly marches to Calvary where his life will be asked of him and he pays for your freedom gladly freely. Now if this price was gladly and freely paid for us, if it has been granted to us by faith, then why do we run back to slavery so often? Why are we so eager to put ourselves back into bondage? We're going to take a look at Israelites as an example, and I think it'll give us some understanding. So this is our graphic for the year, our one love freedom graphic, right? And you'll notice here Moses with his staff, his arms up, you see the pyramids in the background representing Egypt. All right, so the story here is that the Israelites are in Egypt, they're in bondage to Pharaoh, and God wants his people to be free. Right, when you think about Moses talking to Pharaoh, what's the phrase that often comes to mind? <laughs> Let my people go. You gotta say it with bass, right? Let my people go. But that phrase has a tagline that's left off of it, and I think that's why a lot of it loses its power. So I wanna show that to you. This is Exodus 8.1. Then the Lord said to Moses, go to Pharaoh, and say to him, thus says the Lord, let my people go that they may serve me. That line is often left off. So that they might serve me, that they might offer sacrifice to me, that they might celebrate a feast to me. These are the common phrases that come after let my people go. God is telling Pharaoh, release my people, free them so that they can come and serve me. Why? Because the freedom of God's people is most experienced in service to God. When you are serving God and loving God, that is where you are most free. Let my people go so that they may serve me. Now God desires his people to be free and so he begins to work. God sends Moses. He sends Aaron. He gives Moses a stick that can turn into a snake. He starts doing plagues upon all of Egypt, right? He's talking to Pharaoh through Moses. Moses is doing everything he can. God is doing everything he can. Pharaoh finally, after the death of his firstborn, says, you know what? Get out of here. And so Israel leaves. God parts the Red Sea. They walk through. Their enemies come to chase them down. God swallows up their enemies. Israel is free from Egypt. Three days into the wilderness, they start complaining against God. Three days, they begin to complain against God. And this is the kind of stuff they start to say. Exodus 16.3. The sons of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the Lord's hand in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the pots of meat, when we ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill the whole assembly with hunger. Man, would it be better for us to just have died in slavery than to be free? Check this out. Numbers 11, 5, and 6. 
we remember the fish which we used to eat free in Egypt, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic, but now our appetite is gone. There's nothing at all to look at except this manna. Let me say that for you in plainer English. There's nothing for us to look at except this miraculous food that rains down from heaven every day because God loves and provides for us. What about the melons and the garlic? They had garlic in Egypt. Do you see how foolish this is? They have been freed by God and they want to go back to a place of bondage. Why? Because they had leeks. They had melons. If you want to go back into slavery because you missed the taste of garlic, you is scraping the bottom of the barrel. <laughs> they forget what was happening in Egypt. God sends spies to go check out the promised land, right? They come back and there's only a couple spies that are like, brah, huge blessing in this land. Everybody else is like, I don't know, it's kind of scary. And here's what they say, Numbers 14.3. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword. Our wives and our little ones will become plunder. Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? This is what the Israelites who are free say to God and Moses. Wouldn't it be better to go back to Egypt? They had melons and fruit and meat and bread. Yeah, there was slavery and whippings and beatings and forced labor, sure, but they had garlic. Do you see how foolish Israel is being at this point? They want to go back to slavery because they remember the good things that they had when they were in bondage. Forgetting why they wanted to leave in the first place. They believe freedom and joy are found in having what they want. Why does Israel want to go back to Egypt? It's not because they can serve God better. It's because they can serve themselves better. They want to be free to live and do what they please. And they think that's where true freedom lies. Now we're all looking at this story. We're giggling and shaking our heads and going, bro, these Portuguese, like how could they so quickly forget what is happening, right? Keep that mentality because I want to show us something. You remember when um, Nathan is talking to David, right? David has sinned. He's, he's slept with somebody else's wife, Bathsheba. He has killed her husband, and now he thinks he's gotten away with it. And so Nathan, who is the prophet at the time, comes to David, and he tells David a story. And he tells David, look, there was this rich man, had all this kind of stuff, and he had a visitor come. And instead of taking from his abundance, he went and stole this one little ewe lamb from this man who only had that one lamb. Took it, gave it to his friend. He asks David, Nathan says, David, what should happen to this man? And what does David say? That man should die. And Nathan says to him, you are the man. That is the only time you don't want to hear you the man. <laughs> David says he should die. Nathan says, you're the guy. Now, why does Nathan tell him a story? Because he could have just came up to him and said, bro, you're dead. You've done wrong. You're an idiot. But he tells him a parable. Why? Because he's not in the story. He can give an objective view to what is happening, right? He will judge correctly because he doesn't have that personal baggage. So that he can look at this story and go, oh, yeah, that dude deserves death. Back to Israel. We can look at the Israelites and go, bunch of dum-dums. Wanting to go back into slavery. Wanting to have all of these things. You are the men. If you're reading the story of Israel in the Exodus and you're wondering who you are in the story, you're probably not Moses. You're definitely not God. You're Israel. I'm Israel. We will often gladly submit ourselves again to slavery. We will long for the things that we had before we knew Jesus. Now why? When Israel is walking through the wilderness, right, they are no longer in Egypt. And the question I'm asking is, are they really free at that moment? And I would argue, no. See, they're no longer in Egypt, but there's still a whole lot of Egypt in them. They're no longer physically in bondage, but there's so much bondage in their heart that they cannot truly be free. And we see this in the way that they want to worship God. 
The first thing God commands them outside of Egypt is do not make graven images. The whole assembly of Israel says, we will not make graven images. Moses goes up to the mountain for 40 days and Israel goes, make us a graven image. Aaron, make us something to worship. And Aaron goes, okay. Give me your earrings, give me your bracelets. He makes his golden calf and they worship. Why? Because that's how they worshiped in Egypt. They had idols to worship. They had things to hold on to. God is not like other gods. We cannot worship him like we worship other things. But there's too much Egypt in Israel. Even if they're free, they still want to worship their bondage. They still love to run back to slavery. Sadly, too many Christians live this way. There are a lot of Christians running around, I heard this said, there are a lot of Christians who are spiritual streakers. Running around with a helmet of salvation on and nothing else. Are you saved? Yes. Is there joy? No. Do you, do you feel safe from the attacks of the enemy? Nope, fire arrows hitting me every day. Are, are you serving? Are you blessed? Are you in the fellowship? Nope, but I'm saved. Running around with a helmet of salvation, naked everywhere else and wondering why you're struggling. Why? Because we like to run back to bondage. The flesh likes to run back to bondage. And family, just as clearly as we can look at Israel and go, dum-dums. I hope we can look at ourselves and go, what am I doing? There is freedom for me. Why would I run back to bondage? How many times have you looked at your life before Jesus and longed for something that was there? Right? I used to sleep with whoever I wanted to. I used to smoke whatever I wanted to. I used to come and go as I pleased. Right? I was so free. I was so blessed at that time. You, you see how Satan takes things that we've once prayed for and made it look like a burden? Right? If you've been married, you know how many times you've thought, man, man, I used to just do whatever I wanted to. Now I've got to check in with my spouse. Or you have kids and you used to go, bro, we used to just get up and go to the beach. Now we've got to pack 30,000 things before we can get out of the door. <laughs> but didn't you once pray for a wife? Didn't you once pray for children and now that you have them, you see how Satan wants to turn it into a burden for you? Why? Because he wants you in bondage. He wants you to think that you're more free outside of the blessing of God. You're more free if these kids weren't here, if this spouse was in you. You're more free if you weren't actually living in holiness. Right? And he'll show you your friends who are not living according to Christ and show you their freedom. Look, they can go sleep with whoever they want to. They don't have to worry about holiness or righteousness. They're sleeping in on Sunday. Freedom. I guarantee you, you catch those people alone and by themselves. Freedom is the last word they would use to describe who they are. Because freedom is not found in doing what you want to do. That's what we did before Jesus. Look where we ended up. You know how many testimonies I've heard of people who are like, bro, before Jesus, I smoked what I wanted to smoke, drank what I wanted to drink, made all the money in the world, had all the girls, the fame, whatever. And you know what? I hated it. Bondage. You can have everything this world has to offer and be in shackles because you do not have Jesus. Now Jesus loves you and he provides freedom for you by his own blood. We are fools to not receive it. We don't understand what freedom is because Satan is really good at blinding us. Um, I used to live out on the countryside and my friends always used to want to come to Waikiki to go clubbing or whatever, right? I was the only one who had a car, so I was always a designated driver. So we come into Waikiki and almost every week, same story. They drink too much, they have a terrible time. We go home the next week, let's do it again. <laughs> the worst time, we go to a club in Waikiki. We're there about five minutes. There's 10 of us, something like that. We go to Waikiki, five minutes, one of us is getting dragged out by the bouncer. So everybody has to leave. We go outside. Bro, what is going on? So he wants to fight with somebody else. Turns out this other dude has a whole bunch of friends, one of whom is acting like he's got a gun. I am the only sober one in this group. Guys, let's go. We get out of here. I'm trying to drag everybody back. One of the girls in the group slips under my arm and goes and punches one of these dudes in the face. So now I gotta get sister girl back. I finally get her back. We get everybody back into the lobby of a hotel. Now the girls start yelling at other girls in the lobby of the hotel. So I gotta get them away from that. We finally get up to the hotel room. Okay, there's gonna be peace. They start fighting each other in the hotel room. One guy threatening for throwing another guy off the balcony. So I gotta take him downstairs and sober him up. It is four o'clock in the morning. 
in Waikiki, we got to get him food. If you buying plate lunch in Waikiki at 4 o'clock in the morning, you have made poor decisions. <laughs> We're trying to get this guy sober so that he can go calm down and get home. We finally get him home. I get back to the hotel room. Everybody's out. The next day, I'm driving them home, and they're talking about, last night was so much fun. You is about to get kicked out of my truck. <laughs> Do you see how easily we're blinded to the pain and the hurt and the sorrow because of those five seconds of joy? If you think Satan is not pulling that trick on you on the daily, wake up. If you think he's not trying to convince you that you had a good time in bondage, wake up. Because I'm the sober friend telling you, you did not have a good time. I was there. Family, he's going to tempt you with the melons and the garlic and the leeks and all the nice things that were in Egypt, but you were in bondage. Do not forget that. Because if you want to be free, it's not about doing what you want. Let my people go that they may serve me, that they may live for God. Now, we have to understand as Christians how we live in this world, right? So look at verse 16 in Galatians 5. Same chapter. Verse 16. Paul says this. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. Paul is giving us a really clear description here of how we exist as Christians, and we have the Spirit, and we have the flesh. The desires of the spirit and the flesh are always opposed to each other, meaning you cannot satisfy the flesh and the spirit at the same time. You are walking in one or the other. There is no sense in which you can be selfish and do what you want and then also glorify God. There is a hard line that you must stand on either side. You cannot straddle that line. And so we exist in the flesh and the spirit. And here's the problem. Most Christians believe that their truest identity is the flesh. That is not true. Most Christians believe I'm just this terrible person. This is who I am. This is the depth of my identity. This is who I'm always going to be. Wrong. If you are a Christian, if you believe in Christ for your salvation, if you know that he has given you freedom, then your truest nature is son or daughter of God. Holy and beloved child of the most high God, given his spirit and the mind of Christ, that you can live a holy life. That is the truest identity of who you are. Now you have the flesh. Don't think that that's gone. You have the flesh, but you don't have to be in the flesh. It is something that can tempt us or convince us. Um, I read this. This won't be overhead for you. You're going to have to listen back like in the old days, okay? <laughs> Believers find within themselves contrary urgings. The spirit sustains the regenerate desires and purposes. Their fallen endemic instincts, even though if they're dethroned, they're not destroyed. They constantly distract them from doing God's will to allure them along paths that lead to death. In plain English, what that means is you have instincts from the flesh. They have been dethroned, but they have not been destroyed. And so they're still going to tempt you and pull you, but you do not have to bow to those instincts. You do not have to obey those instincts. You are free in Christ to live a free and holy life. Our great freedom and joy family is being like Jesus. Freedom from sin. Not to sin. Freedom from bondage. Freedom to do whatever we wanted was what we had before we knew Jesus and there's a reason we left that life behind. Don't let Satan bring you back with thoughts of melons and garlic and fun times. Live in freedom. Turn with me to John chapter 8. You're going to be a couple books to your left here. You see Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John chapter 8. When you get there, find verse 31. John 8, 31 says this. So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine and you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never yet been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone 
who commits sin is the slave of sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. See, these men didn't understand what Jesus was telling them. You will be free. They're like, we're Abraham's descendants. We've never been in slavery. How can you say we need to be free? If you commit sin, if you practice sin, you are a slave to that sin. It is your master. Now, if anyone in this room has ever had addiction, you know what it is to be a slave to sin. To obey a cruel master knowing that it will hurt you and you do it anyway because you have no choice. You've known the bondage that it has to, to hate and to love this thing that you are addicted to. It is because you are a slave to the sin which you commit. And it cannot bring you freedom to commit it. That's another lie Satan likes to tell us. If you do it, then it'll stop bugging you. If you give into it, then you won't have this nagging feeling of doing it. That's where your freedom lies. Mm -mm. That's just more bondage for you. You're continuing to eat a poison apple wondering why you feel bad. Family, freedom is being able to say no to these things. And now notice, uh, back in Galatians 5.13, it says this, you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love, serve one another. So how do we counter then wanting to serve ourselves, to serve the flesh? How do we counter the bondage of self-seeking and self-serving? It says, through love, serve one another. This is freedom. Freedom is being able to serve and to love others. Not living for ourselves. Serving and loving other people is the most free that we can be. The desires of the flesh will always be selfish. The desires of the spirit will always be outward focused. To God and to others. Now love, loving others, is not just an emotion that gives us the tinglys. Right? It's an action that pours forth things to bless and to care for other people. Matthew 20 says this. Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. Talking about authority. And their great men exercise authority over them. It is not this way among you. But whoever wishes to become great shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. Just as the Son of Man, meaning Jesus, did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. How did Jesus live his freedom? Service. He served you, he served me, he served the disciples. Right? When they're having an argument at the Last Supper about which of them is the greatest, Jesus serves them. He washes their feet. Jesus has the authority and power to do anything he wants in that moment. And when I say anything he wants, I mean anything that he wants. He has all power that he needs to have to make anything happen. And what he wants to make happen is to get down on his hands and knees and wash the feet of the disciples. Why? Because he is free. Because he is living in the freedom that God has given him. This is the example of perfect love that Jesus gives us. He serves us because he loves us. And if we love one another, we ought to serve one another. This is freedom. Now service is seen by a lot of people as bondage. This is how Satan has flipped the definition of freedom, right? And I know this because often when I'm talking to people about serving, I'll hear stuff like, oh, but it's so early. <laughs> Once a week? Really? Because what they've been convinced of is that it's bondage to you to have to commit to something once a week. To have to wake up early, not be able to sleep in on Sunday when you want to, that's bondage is what Satan has convinced you of. Rather than that is true freedom. The abundant life is serving others. We have a Levite ministry in this church. They get here before everybody else. They set everything up, clean the bathrooms, make sure everything is all good. And I have tried to talk to people about joining that ministry and I will often get, but it's so early. Yes, it is. Get up. <laughs> because when I hear, oh, it's so early, what I hear is, man, but I really love to sleep. Would it be good for me to get up and prepare the house of God so that nothing hinders the worship of the people? That God will be presented before a place clean and holy so the people of God can come in? Yes, but it's so early. But it'll cost me. But I really like my bed. 
Because we're convinced that freedom is sleeping in rather than sacrifice so that other people can worship the Lord. When I ask people to join the parking ministry, right? I'm just driving golf carts. Like, isn't there anything more important that I can do? I don't know. Helping Auntie get from the back to the front safely when she can only walk half a mile an hour. Is that important? Yes. That auntie who barely showed up to church with six kids because they kolohe and she didn't know how for help get them ready in time. Is it important to get her to the door and tell her good job? Yes. Is it important to make sure people can get here safely? You might be the first conversation somebody has with anybody all day. Is that important? Yeah. But it's so early. <laughs> Serving people is freedom. The people who serve in that cafe, you making people coherent so they can listen. You make it, with making a cup of coffee, you're making sure people can function in church. Don't tell me that's not a holy work. <laughs> but then I have to miss the first set of worship. You worshiping out there, what are you talking about? The people who serve in the children's ministry, you're making sure parents can come and receive the word so that they can go home and bless their kids. You're making sure those kids are raised up in the way that they should go. Yeah, but they don't listen. <laughs> Neither do you, go serve. Do you see how Satan wants to take the gift of God of service and make it like it's a bondage to us? Family, stop biting that apple. To serve others is a freedom. It is a joy. It is a blessing. And I cannot imagine the joy in God's heart when he watches his kids serve and bless and just be stoked to show up early and bless other people. To do something as simple as making a cup of coffee, cleaning the place up, being an usher, being a greeter, whatever. There's so many ways you can be free and serve. And it doesn't have to just be here at One Love. There's plenty of places you can serve. But serve. Serve with joy and catch Satan when he's trying to make you convinced that like, service is a burden to you. Yeah? Serving one another. This is freedom. Jesus has freed us from the power of sin, from the punishment of sin, from guilt, from shame, from slander, from lies. Do not subject yourself again to a yoke of slavery. There is free air of heaven available for you right now so what are you going to do with this freedom what would it look like for you to be free in the love of God family this year I pray that my brothers and sisters are free be free now what do you need to be free from you need to be free from lies Listen, you might be walking in freedom. You might be serving well in the church. You might be doing awesome things. How do you talk to yourself? What are the things that you say about yourself when nobody else is around? Because if you're speaking wicked things over yourself, you're in bondage. I want you to be free from the opinions of other people. I want you to not be so scared what people think about you, so scared that you can't just come and be who you are. You have to wear this mask or this weight jacket of who you think people want you to be. Be free. The only person you need to worry about whose opinion of you is Jesus. And he's already spoken. It's all in here. Be free from worrying about what other people think. Be free of trying to perform for somebody else to approve your work. Be free from the questions of do I matter? Is anybody going to notice if I'm gone? Be free from the lie that you can never be what God wants you to be. If God has begun a good work in you, who's going to complete it? God, stop trying to finish it in the flesh. Stop trying to be the one who completes the work. God completes the work. Trust him. Family, be free from selfishness. Be free from sin. Listen, if you have a hidden sin in your life, you ain't hiding it from nobody. You are a slave to that thing. God sees you and you know you see it yourself. You cannot fully enjoy the freedom of fellowship if there is sin hiding in your life. Confess, get rid of it, let it be free. Family, living as God has caused you to live is such a joy. But trying to steal little things from God how we live, how we date, how we talk, whatever. Trying to not do it God's way and do it our own way, you will be in bondage. It may not be fully, it may not be completely, but I promise you, you're missing something. Why would you not want this freedom? Why would we subject again to slavery? 
We Portuguese sometimes. We need help. This is why God has given you a body of believers that you can be a part of. This is why the church exists to love and to bless and to care for others. Family, if you are doing your Christian walk, just you and Jesus, you're doing it wrong. Not even Jesus wants it to be just you and Jesus. There's a reason you have brothers and sisters to love you and to hold you accountable. If you have brothers and sisters in Christ who have been calling you out on a sin and you are ignoring them, you are ignoring the grace of God. God is trying to speak to you through your family and you are ignoring them because you choose bondage. And I don't want any of you to leave this place slaves. Family, be free to live and to love as God has designed you. No more fear of what people think. No more fear of how things will turn out. No more fear of condemnation. No more fear of what's gonna happen in the world. No more fear of what happens if this person or that person gets elected. God is on the throne. Be free to enjoy the place that you live in right now. Be free to love the people around you. Because if we are a people of freedom, then we will set others free. If we are a people of bondage, we will help other people stay in bondage. Family, look at me. If the sun sets you free, you are free indeed. Walk in that freedom, live in that freedom, love that freedom, share that freedom, and now go set somebody else free. Whatever you need to do today to lay things down, to pray things, to confess things, do that work today. Do not live another second in the bondage of the flesh and of sin. You know we always got prayer team members on both sides of the stage, family. They're there to pray with you. If you need freedom, go pray. If you know somebody else who needs freedom, go pray. Whatever it is you need to do, do it so that you can walk out of here and breathe that fresh air of heaven. Amen? Aloha, I'm Derek, the executive pastor at One Love. And I want to say thank you for tuning in today. We hope that you were inspired and strengthened with today's celebration. If you're new to One Love, we encourage you to visit us online at onelove.org and fill out a connect card so we can keep you up to date with all the things happening here. While you're there, you can also learn more about One Love, submit prayer requests, or see more of our studies through the Bible. There are many ways to stay connected, so we encourage you to take that first step. If you're watching today's celebration via YouTube, we encourage you to subscribe to our channel and click the bell icon to keep informed with new messages. Most importantly, if you made a decision to follow Jesus Christ today, we encourage you to click on our I Said Yes to Christ link at the bottom of the website and fill out the form so we can stay connected. One last thing, if you want to learn more about the good news of Jesus Christ, we encourage you to visit goodnewshawaii.com. There you'll find five short videos about living a life in Christ and a free discipleship booklet designed to encourage you your new faith. Mahalo for tuning in to One Love Today. We hope you were blessed by our time together. Aloha.